It is my pleasure to introduce Tony Dagarunyage Evans. He is a multiple award-winning reporter and columnist at the Idaho Mountain Express in the Ketchum Sun Valley area, which has been voted the best community newspaper in the United States by the National Newspaper Association, which is really pretty remarkable. Um, remarkable Yay Tony and Remarkable Mountain Express. That's just really terrific. Uh, Tony studied cultural anthropology and biology at the University of Colorado at Boulder and won the expatriate scholarship to the Prague Summer Writing Workshop at Charles University in 1996. His writing has also been published in the Taos News, Santa Fe New Mexican, Mountain Gazette, Idaho Arts Quarterly, Boise Weekly, and the Environmental News Network. He has contributed reporting to the BBC Live Sunday Edition and Boise State Public Radio. So we can't really applaud um, uh, as we might <laughs> normally do if he was in a room and we were all here with him. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Tony. But thank you so much for, uh, for uh, uh, coming here and, and sharing your book and, and your stories with us. Um, and right now, I am going to put you on <clears throat> spotlight. <clears throat> Let's see. And so Tony will be the only person that we see now. Well, before, um, yeah. Um, well, great. Thanks, Kristen. This is really fun. I, I look at all the screens. I feel like I'm having a, a cup of tea with Liz. Tony, you'll have to. Oh. There you go. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I should have said I'm going to mute everybody now. <laughs> Caught you unawares. It's just really fun, Zoom. You know, I feel like I'm uh, in everybody's living room right now, so it's kind of fun for me. <clears throat> Liz and Amy are having a cup of tea or dinner over here at one point. Somebody, I'm on somebody else's back porch over here. It's really exciting. I want to welcome you guys to Indian Country today. Uh, I'm going to share screens here and get started in my talk. Kristen, you're going to have to probably make sure I'm working here. This is a, a picture that illustrates just how big uh, Indian country really is in North America. As, as, as I'm sure you all know, there were people living here for thousands of years before European immigration. And uh, although many of the tribes, some of the tribes are no longer exist, many are uh, are enrolled federally recognized tribes, hundreds and hundreds, I think over 400. And uh, they don't all have reservations but of any size, but they do have traditional territories. <clears throat> I like showing this slide to give people uh, an idea of where the different cultures existed here on Turtle Island, North America. And if you look here for Idaho area, you'll see Shoshone and Bannock, you'll see Lemhi Shoshone, uh, Eastern Shoshone. The Shoshone Indians um, cover the vast territory out west and where we are right now in the Wood River Valley is on Shoshone Bannock territory. <clears throat> my, uh, my work, oops, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, my work on this book started with a, a handful of articles for the Idaho Mountain Express seven or eight years ago, and developed into a book at the suggestion of a retired school teacher here in the Valley, Mike Healy. Uh, he read the articles and he said, why don't you turn those into a book? And I said, well, if you'll be my editor and help me put it together, I'm happy to. So we went to work thinking it might take a couple of months. Nearly three years later, we were finished. And uh, one of the big challenges for me was that I wanted to go about it correctly and uh, get in touch first of all, with the original inhabitants of the Wood River Valley. Um, and uh, one of the people I met was Lionel Boyer, who wrote the introduction. He was a former chairman of the Shoshone Bannock tribes. And I learned a whole lot from Lionel in the writing of this book. And uh, he essentially approved of the final publication. And I think if you're going to do this kind of work, it's important to reach out to the tribes who still exist, who still have memories of the land, connections to the territory and stories to tell. 
I gave a, a book launch talk at the community library a few years ago, and uh, I was really honored at that time to have visits from some people from the Shoshone and Bannock Nations. Uh, this is a young man, uh, his name is Young Chief Washaki, and he's uh, actually pictured on the cover of my book. And he came with his parents and his grandparents. He's from the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, Agadika Band, Shoshone. Uh, his grandparents were Agadika Shoshone. His mother works at the Indian uh, Health Service at uh, the Fort Hall Reservation, and his father um, lives and works in, at the Wind River Reservation. The war bonnet that Young Chief is wearing is 125 years old. This is an uh, extraordinary example of his family tribal regalia. And uh, I was told that the war bonnet was made by the medicine man of the famous Chief Washakie, who, if you want to look him up, he's a quite an interesting character in American history. I've done some writing uh, with the Wind River Reservation recently, and uh, Chief Washakie um, was the only uh, Indian chief to ever gain a full military burial. And he was well respected by many, many uh, tribes in the West. And he actually chose the Wind River Reservation for his people, which is very, very rare to actually have the opportunity through negotiation and you know, the power of his presence and his uh, connections in the area to actually choose the reservation vast reservation over in Wyoming um, on the other side of the Wind River Mountains. So I like to think every story, every good book uh, starts with a moment, a uh, spark of inspiration. And my inspiration to write this book began right here. I don't know how many years ago, uh, I've been in the Wood River Valley for a good long while. And I think it probably was the first few years I was living here and I came across and saw this highway marker that uh, announces that a fellow named Alexander Ross discovered this summit in September 18, 1824. Now, I took issue with the, with the wording, especially the word discovered. And it seemed preposterous to me that uh, Alexander Ross, who I came to learn was a Scottish school teacher who got involved in the beaver trade, was looking for some adventure, went out west, worked for the beaver companies, Hudson's Bay, I believe. And um, I actually Googled him. I looked up and found he had a memoir that he wrote after his retirement from his adventures. He was living in Red River, um, in Canada, I believe it was in BC. And uh, he describes uh, actually making his way up the Wood River Valley back in the day with a contingent of people, including some Iroquois Indians, which I was pleased to see that we had some representatives here. I happened to be a member of an Iroquois nation. And um, they made it up to the summit and it was quite, a, quite an ordeal for them to get there. But when he mused for a minute or two about being the first human being to ever lay eyes on the Sawtooth Basin, this beautiful, pristine valley, very remote. Um, he looked down at his feet and he found a grouse with an arrow stuck in it and the bird was still alive and kicking. And that's when he realized not only was he not the first person to see the summit or discover the summit, but he's probably being watched and followed the entire way. And uh, it's likely that the people who were following him were, uh, I came to learn from Leo and Lionel and other friends from Fort Hall that were probably the Tukadeka people. And these are called the Mountain Shoshone, one band of the vast uh, Nue or Nume people known as the Shoshone. The Tukadeka were a very interesting group and they still exist. They're still Tukadeka band people. And uh, they were known for well, living high in the mountains, hunting sheep, and uh, they made a bow and arrow that was extremely powerful that would uh, was eventually sold and uh, traded downstream to the buffalo hunters because of the power of these bows made from the sheep horns. So 
So I started looking around to find out, you know, what is the history of the Indians here in the Wood River Valley? What tribes were they? I started looking through photographs. This is one picture I turned up at the Regional History Museum, Regional History Library, I'm sorry, at the Community Library in Ketchum. And uh, I'll just ask if anyone can recognize the geography in the background there. Usually if there's some kids in the audience, they'll recognize it right away. Um, this is Dollar Mountain. And it doesn't have the, uh, the tower on top or the ski lifts, but this is Sun Valley Road, probably in the 1930s. A celebration of uh, Sun Valley Resort. So it would have been after 1936, I believe. Um, Kristen, could you give me a hand on setting up the laser pointer? Do you happen to know how to do that? I don't, Tony. Um, you magically did that yourself. Um, oh, I found it. Oh, la, la, see? La, la, la. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so this is Dollar Mountain back here. If you look through on the other side of this 4th of July parade, there's a, a guy in a, in a full war bonnet over here. Um, and this, of course, is a travaux that uh, was used after the uh, advent of the horse in the West, which would have come after 1700, 1680 or so. Uh, the Pueblo Revolt in Santa Fe was when the first large uh, groups of horses were released into North America. And of course, uh, Native communities adopted them quickly and bred their own horses, especially out here in Idaho, the Nez Perce uh, Appaloosa, by, uh, by the 1800s, there were horses widespread and in use all over um, the West. So I use this photo in the book uh, because it showed that there were people coming to Sun Valley, uh, native people here coming here to celebrate their culture, uh, participating in the 4th of July parade, I'm pretty sure. I also started asking around to people, friends. I talked to some people at the uh, at the hunting shop here on River Street, <clears throat> um, High Desert Sports. My friend Wayne said, "Oh, you're working on a book about Indians. So, did you have you seen the map?" And I said, "Well, what map is that, Wayne?" Well, a couple of days later, I came back and he had a big framed copy of this. It's been in. Uh, uh, on exhibit at the Blaine County Historical Museum for quite a while. But what we did for the use of this uh, illustration in the book is we put into red several of the trails called out on this 1880s mining map. Um, in red, this one is uh, describes an old Indian trail, if you can read it on your screens. Again, this one well, this one comes down into Ketchum. This would be roughly the location of Trail Creek Road coming up and passing the uh, Sun Valley Lodge on the right up and over Trail Creek Summit. You have another old Lemhi Trail down here, which could be reference to, uh, of course, the Mormon history and Mormon religion. Um, it could also indicate the Lemhi Shoshone because they became known as the Lemhi Shoshone. They're actually the mountain Shoshone more apt description. And this is coming down into Molden Canyon at Bellevue. This one up here, this old Indian trail, labeled as such, comes right down into the North Fork of the Big Wood, where the cursor is here would be the SNRA Visitors Center today. So one of my goals uh, in working with the tribes going forward, if it's at all possible, I'd like to uh, at least let the general public know that there are these trails in existence uh, on an old map and that these are well-known roads that were being used, paths that were being used for a good long while, um, apparently, before uh, the miners came to the valley and set up shop and started mapping their mining claims. Tony, um, a question. Um, yeah. When you say a road or a trail, um, you had shown a picture of a, of a travois before. Um, mm -hmm. Would they be, would these trails be just wide enough for a horse or would they be, you know, four, five, six feet wide that would accommodate um, uh, a pole travois? 
I don't know. And uh, I've often puzzled over the actual locations of these trails. I was told by my friend Wayne that he was hiking up over Bellevue and found what appeared obviously to him to be an old trail. It was somewhere between Bellevue and Haley in this high country up there. He said it was clearly an ancient trail. Um, the archaeologists probably know a lot more than they're ever going to tell us about these sites because they're uh, BLM officials. Uh, uh, it's their legal requirement that they protect uh, cultural sites from destruction. And the best way they can do that is to not disclose the location of cultural sites. I happen to be writing an article about a, a site that I discovered myself, and I'm interviewing some BLM people and finding out that they know a lot about these sites. The tribes themselves also know a lot, but they all oftentimes will not disclose the actual locations of places where there could be artifacts, there could be cultural and sacred sites, um, because they don't want pot hunters or people to destroy that site. But I've walked in all three of these areas, and uh, right now there are trails, and I've followed this one all up and over. Of course, uh, Trail Creek Road was changed from the original trail, but I think um, it's easy looking at the topography to find out where the easiest way was down through the valley before the road was built. And it probably went down to the old waterfall that's down at the very base of the, of the valley. Um, Muldoon Road, I believe, goes right up along the old trail here, um, the old Lemhi Trail. I'm pretty sure that road was built and it goes right over into Cottonwood, uh, the Littlewood, I'm sorry. So, of course, things have, a lot of things have changed in recent years. I talked to Belder Resource at the uh, Language and Cultural Department and when I was talking about this map many years ago, and uh, I said, do you know of any other uh, old Indian trails in the Wood River Valley that I can use on my map? And she said, sure, Tony, have you ever heard of Highway 75? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, okay, I have. She said, well, you know, we were using the trails through that valley for a long, long time. And uh, she said, we went up there and we gathered choke cherries and we got salmon and we hunted deer. We brought the deer hides back. And well, some of those details are in the book if you, um, if you care to learn further. Tony, we do have a follow-up question. Um, yeah. Asking if these uh, old Indian trails have blazes or some other kind of mark um, that the native folks would have been used, that would have used to make sure they were on the right route. Apparently, these marks are still found on the Lolo Trail in uh, Montana. Um, it's a good question, and I, I just don't know. Um, yeah, that's a question for the tribes or perhaps for somebody who's more knowledgeable about it. Thank you. I just know from my personal experience that I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen such thing. Oh, oh, I think I just hit the wrong button here. Sorry. Um, okay. Try just, try just cl clicking on the um, the image that you're on and see if it just pops up naturally. Right now, we're seeing all the kind of the tiles of your slideshow. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I hit something uh, wrong kind of thing here. There you go. That's where you're at. Mm -hmm. Is that working for you? Because now mine's mine, mom, now mine's all haywire. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> okay, there we go. Let's just stay with that. <clears throat> Can you guys see okay? Yeah, this is good. This is the, the map of the Indian trails. So in... Um, in recreating the path that I took in researching and writing the book, um, it led to uh, some, some old discoveries in archaeology around here. Uh, this is a site in the Sawtooth Basin uh, near Redfish Lake. I do not locate its actual location because that wouldn't be a great idea. But um, this is Redfish Overhang. and. Uh, the history of this site goes back at least 10,000 years. And there were, at the time I was writing the book, uh, well, actually a year or two before the book came out, um, this site was vandalized. There were, there are cave, there are cave paintings, pictographs inside 
uh, the redfish overhang that were vandalized. And when I went to visit with my wife during the summer of the great eclipse, does anyone remember that? We just happened to be over the hill at that time and I walked up to the, to the overhang. I never spent any time there and there was a sign indicating do not enter because of the vandalism. The tribes had really um, started to protect this site. It's actually a sacred site um, to the Shoshone and the Bannock people, perhaps other tribes as well. And uh, federal laws allow for native people to visit their sacred sites and to have access to them on public land far from the reservation. And wherever you see um, any sort of cultural artifacts or artwork, you can be sure that this is actually a sacred site still in use by people today. And when we stood outside of the redfish overhang, my wife and I, a couple of archaeologists came down the hill and one of them was a big tall uh, native guy, young man who, his name was uh, Timothy Wildcat Haskett. And uh, I told him who I was and what we were interested in. And <clears throat> he said, uh, I said, Haskett, that's the name of the, of the tools that this uh, particular area is named after. They name the different layers of an archeological layer after Sometimes the person who discovered the tool or the location of the tool, the Clovis points are named after Clovis, New Mexico, where they were first um, excavated. Hasket points, Hasket technology is from this area. He said, oh yeah, those are named after my grandpa. So Timothy, who was studying um, anthropology at Idaho State University at the time, his grandfather was uh, somebody who was an amateur archeologist and they ended up naming the Hasket tool technology uh, which was quite old um, for his grandfather. Now here's a uh, another site where you have uh, paintings. Um, I'm not an expert on naming the ages of these sites, but it could be quite old. And uh, there are no horses, but there's a dog in there. And this is a, a picture someone sent me from um, the Middle Fork of the Salmon River. And again, these are sacred sites and they are not to be touched, damaged, or in any way harmed or taken from. Only last summer did I learn about this even much more ancient site. This is Cooper's Ferry. It's an area on the lower Salmon River to the north uh, at the junction of Rock Creek, it's called. <clears throat> And this area right here is an excavation going on that people have known about since the 1960s. But what's happened in the last year or two is Lauren Davis from University of Oregon, who I had the pleasure, the honor to interview last week for a national public radio story. Um, he said about digging deeper and deeper on this site in working with the Nez Perce tribes, um, whenever there is a site excavated there, the State Historic Preservation Office gets involved. The BLM in this case, because it was BLM land, <clears throat> contacts the tribes and they uh, begin an excavation uh, under the guidance of the local tribal members. And what they discovered here is extraordinary. This uh, Cooper's Ferry site um, sets back the date for the original inhabitants uh, not only of Idaho, but of North America so far. This is the oldest um, known human site in North America, and it is thought to be 16,000 years old. Now, this was a time when there were mastodons, there were, I'm sorry, there were mammoths, there were short-faced bears, Pleistocene horses. It was a very different environment at that time. It was Ice Age. It was a lot of ice around. It was a dry and arid environment. Um, interestingly, the Salmon River, Lauren told me, um, well, at least the people here didn't seem to be eating a lot of salmon. And he's wondering if the salmon runs even existed at that time. It could be that the salmon were running into different rivers back then because the rivers might have had a different uh, nature to them. But anyway, this is a, a really big deal, uh, this discovery, and it's changed the textbooks um, it is thought now that 
if human beings came to North America and weren't already here at that time during the last ice age, they likely did not come across the Bering Land Bridge as once supposed during an interstitial period through a dry patch in the Bering uh, Land Bridge, but they came along the shore instead, likely even in boats. Um, they're not really sure. But the idea now is that people came down along the coast of what is now Alaska, although the water would have been much, much shallower and the shelf would have gone out much further. Um, that's why the, it's very difficult to do archaeology from that period because it's all flooded under the ocean now. Um, but this, uh, Lauren describes the Columbia River entering into the Snake River and then into the Salmon River. He said that would have been basically the first left you would have taken had you come in and wanted to go inland and follow the rivers. And where there are rivers, there are animals. And where there's animals, there's game, there's livelihood, there's exploration. And it is now thought that um, this is the oldest uh, archeological site in North America. So flash forward about 16 millennia and you have uh, a period of the reservation system um, in the 1800s out west. And uh, this was a time when people were um, spending more, less and less time doing their traditional um, foraging, hunting, migrating for game, traveling seasonally with the plants and animals to regular places where they set up their teepees. And they were, of course, forced onto reservations. We think this story, this picture taken by Eugene Ants, who was a well-known local photographer uh, during the turn of the century and before, um, took this picture at Fort Hall. Now, the people at Fort Hall had a very good reason to come to Camas Prairie. Uh, which is right around the corner from the Wood River Valley, basically an extension of it. The Camas Prairie had um, this blue plant called Camas. And blue Camas is a staple food crop for many, many Western tribes, including the Nez Perce, who, um, according to the, to the record, uh, supplied the explorers Lewis and Clark on their court of discovery after they came over the Lolo Pass and told them, you know, you can eat this. And they had tried to eat it, but it wasn't cooked properly. And, you know, I've had it um, well, after it's been baked in the ground for a night by a guy named uh, Bronco over there at Fairfield when I first uh, met the, the, the people I'm gonna tell you about. And it, uh, it tastes like candy. It's sweet, it's rich, it's a staple um, starchy root product that you can store in a jar or a basket for a good long while. And this was an area where many, many tribes gathered for a very, very long time to pick camas, to share their culture, to trade. And camas was also a commodity that was traded far and wide by the Shoshone and Bannock people. When the reservation system separated the people from this food source and led to starvation on the reservations because people were not getting their rations of food that they were promised, by the government, um, obviously hostilities broke out and some people went to war. You'll see another highway sign um, on the Highway 20 near Fairfield that talks about the Bannock War and I go into some detail in my book about the Bannock War. This is uh, Chief Buffalo Road of the Bannock tribe who uh, waged uh, a battle that led to wars, that led to the involvement of numerous tribes and uh, battles that stretched clear into Oregon. Um, eventually, uh, they lost the war and uh, many people went back to the reservation. And uh, although they have been centered there for a good long while, I'm often told by people that, yes, we have a reservation and this is the center of our community but we're not all from here. We're all from all over. And people still have connections to very many places surrounding the reservation, including the Wood River Valley. 
as you will soon see. Tony, we have a question about the CAMAS. Um, has there been any research uh, about the ways that human cultivation benefits the CAMAS? I believe there's been research done on sweetgrass showing human contact is key to a thriving stand. And yeah. I personally have read articles about um, native folks uh, gardening willows, um, finding a good patch of willows and harvesting um, them in a sustained fashion year after year. But what about camas? Well, it's a great question. And uh, I'm not an authority at all on that, but I can direct you to some places. There's a, there's a real um, push, push on right now with nonprofit organizations that I've been in contact with to seek out some of the traditional ecological knowledge of native people. And I was contacted by an ethnobotanist postdoc working at ISU uh, last year. Her name's Georgia Fredalusis. I hope to do some work with her. And uh, she found me through my book, which was given to her at Fort Hall Reservation. And she went there asking that question, you know, what is the, what is the, uh, the nature of the interaction with this plant? And how does the cultivation affect the success of the plant and also the success of the community? Because it's not a domestic plant. It's not domesticated plant like corn, you know, corn you can't, corn won't grow if it just falls on the ground. You have to, um, you have to husk it, you have to plant it. It's, it's, it depends on us. Camus, I think the, the dependence, if there is a symbiotic relationship, I think it's um, a little more subtle than that because Camus hasn't been harvested out there in the way that it traditionally was for a long, long time. Only in patches, you know, they, um, the, some, the people that I, know about that are foraging, that are still gathering camas out there, and they probably have never stopped entirely. This is a traditional use of the tribe. Um, those are the people to ask. And uh, you could ask Georgia Fritalusis, or you could call the Fort Hall tribe. If I find out any more about it, I'll be uh, sure and take some notes. And we'll include um, George's name uh, in the e follow-up email um, so that if you want to follow up with that research, um, yeah. we can do that. Okay. Now, uh, I live in Haley, Idaho, and when I started looking around through the pictures uh, in the library in Ketchum, um, a, an album uh, was, uh, had, had just been donated to the library by the grandson of a Kodak photographer back in um, the early 1900s. And these pictures of these young people, um, I believe they're all children, and I think there's some very young children involved, uh, here as well, um, were walking across what I think is probably Bullion Street or Croy Street, probably Croy Street, um, because it would have gone down and and down through the canyon, I'm sorry, Bullion Street, which is Croy Canyon Road. Um, so uh, they're walking over to the butcher shop. Um, I've been uh, in, in my uh, gathering of oral histories here in the valley. I came to understand that Hot Porter Park or Tourist Park in Haley was a place where uh, Indians camped and caught and smoked trout. I don't know if there were salmon in the river at that time or not, but they caught a fish and they smoked it there and they camped out regularly down at Hot Porter Park. And it could be that these kids are going to the butcher shop um, to try and find some food there. Uh, who knows? But I, I, I really love, there's this, there's this one kid here, there's other pictures in the, in the albums of this young fellow with a, with a hat on, kind of dancing along behind his big sister, it looks like, and I just thought it was adorable, the way they wear their hats. Um, I've had people tell me they thought this was 1916. I don't know, Ted Angle might have some idea. I've had people describe it as 1906. I think that's how when the pictures came in. Um, there's Surely there's ways to date that with the, the power lines. This is the kind of thing that would have a date mark on it. Um, there's a rodeo posters down here. When I got this photograph home and I opened them up and I was looking at them, what was extraordinary for me is I was sitting at my office, my desk, in my living room, where I am at this present moment, 
and I'm looking out my window, and what I see is this exact skyline right here out of my window. And at that moment, you know, I felt really connected to this place where I live, to the time and to the history of this place, and also to the story. Um, it's very difficult to find pictures of native people in the valley because it was not a friendly place for native people during the mining era and afterwards. Um, there was a war, a lot of people were killed, a lot of things happened, and um, they were not welcome here. And they kept a very low profile. Lionel Boyer was quick to tell me that. And only recently really have there been a resurgence of a, of a, a real organized presence. And I'll describe how that's happened um, since the book came out. Not, not because of the book, but I think uh, some of the relationships have developed around the book. This is Hawk Porter Park. It used to be an Indian camp down here where they smoked their fish. And there's a, an elder in our community, D.A. Utz, uh, who told me the story of going down there and trading a goat skin uh, for some deer skin gloves. And uh, there's different ways that they, they tan hides at Fort Hall that are very, very well known for deer skin gloves and deer skin products in general. And I have a friend, Leo Arrowhite, who's still uh, hands, the gloves, and the skins in the same way. They would be hunting deer in the fall and then come back next spring with leather products to sell as they came through the valley um, to uh, whoever was living here during the early 1900s. Now I showed you that picture of young Chief Washke uh, early on because I wanted to show you what you know traditional regalia looks like and how important it can be uh, as, a, as a cultural expression. And um, this is an example of uh, somebody dressing up like they're Indian back in Ketchum in the 1950s. And uh, these, this was a you know, popular thing to do when, um, at a time when there were laws in this country that uh, suppressed native religion and culture and outlawed native religion and culture. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, before you dress up like an Indian, you might want to um, understand that there's some people very sensitive about that. At a time when um, people were uh, pretending to be Indians, there were actual medicine men going to jail for practicing their own culture. They call it cultural appropriation, I think, nowadays. Um, on the other hand, Here's a bareback rider in uh, the powwow that took place two years ago in Festival Meadows in Sun Valley. And uh, this guy, I'm forgetting his name right now. I think he's getting involved in a movie in Montana about Chief Tendor as we speak. Um, but these are bareback horse racers. And uh, this is a really big deal around here. If you go to the Fort Hall powwow, uh, I don't know that it's happening this year, um, but I've been to it in the past and it's an extraordinary event. And um, yeah, these guys race bareback and, and they also, for the purposes of Wagon Days Parade two years ago, um, dressed the part and <clears throat> showed up in Sun Valley. And uh, that event was extraordinary. It was uh, the first time in living memory that um, Native people came here, they prayed, they danced, they had a powwow and they got the entire community involved. There were a thousand people there. And I had a small part to do with helping to organize that and working with the city of Ketchum as a kind of liaison with certain people in the tribes. But um, it was all theirs and they, um, they, brought, they brought quite an experience to this town. I really enjoyed writing about it. This is my friend, Leo Arawhite. I usually defer people to him if they have any detailed questions about um, native culture here in the Valley. I'll be sure and include his email and contacts. Um, but Leo won uh, the first prize for one of the floats in the parade that year. And um, he is a uh, Agadika Shoshone, Mountain Shoshone uh, salmon eater band. Shoshone. He's also a tribal court judge in Fort Hall. And uh, he and I have gotten to be good friends. I was just talking to him yesterday. And this was the event that took place in Festival Meadows. This is a women's traditional 
um, dance, powwow dance. My mother got out there and danced. She had her regalia, uh, even though we're Mohawks, a long way from the Western tribes. And this is the, uh, the ghost drum um, powwow group that sang, and I helped put up teepees. And once again, here's uh, Dollar Mountain. And uh, at this time, uh, it wasn't part of a 4th of July parade. This was uh, their event entirely. And uh, it was an extraordinary place to be. They wanted to come again this year, but of course with COVID, that's not happening. So in 1973, there was an archeological find up here over the hill in, um, that was excavated because development was gonna take place. That's usually what happens when an excavation um, kicks in is usually when they're gonna build some houses or roads. <clears throat> and uh, in this case, John's Manville Corporation was developing a community that was to be known as Elkhorn on the Brass Ranch. Well, they, they, they found numerous um, artifacts dating back thousands of years, many layers of artifacts at Indian Springs. And um, it was many years later, 1990, that um, finally an archeologist by the name of Claudia Walsworth, who was a friend of mine, uh, she's right here. She organized a, a welcoming ceremony for um, a gentleman, um, James Osborne was his name, who came and they did a ceremony for the ancestors and uh, I don't know if they did reburial of artifacts. Uh, I was told by somebody that human remains were discovered at the site, um, which, uh, you know, it's on private land. So there aren't that many protections for artifacts on private land, like there, like there are very strong protections on public land. But in any case, this uh, was, I think, a very uh, positive development for the relations with people in the valley here, certainly in Sun Valley. And I give uh, Claudia the credit for pulling this together. She's in my book as well. And here she is uh, spending time with Ramona Willema, who is a, a Bannock speaker, uh, Fort Hall. I met her years ago when she invited me to come stay in a teepee there during their powwow. And she's uh, getting, promoting a language, uh, language program there. And, um, Ramona and Claudia and others um, put together a uh, museum exhibit. Uh, unfortunately, this is the wrong picture, <laughs> but there's another picture of the museum. Uh, if you look on the other wall, if I hadn't put the wrong picture on here, you would see um, a uh, tableau of artifacts uh, reaching back many years. And you can go there, it's behind the limelight, Forest Service Park, and there's a permanent collection there. That's um, quite, an, uh, quite a quite a quite uh, a presentation of the history, the deep history of the Wood River Valley. There were people living in Elkhorn. Uh, there's a permanent site there, according to the state archaeologist, uh, at the time that the first uh, miners came to town. You'll often hear that the Indians weren't here when the miners came, but that's just not correct at all. Um, now this guy lived out in Camas Prairie, his grandfather homesteaded in Camas Prairie, and uh, they were given back then, I think they'd get 600 acres or something, and uh, as long as they were willing to, quote, improve the land, and improving the land back then meant that you could make it um, profitable somehow, taxable and uh, usually meant agriculture. And his family came out from Kansas and they, they had a mule and a, uh, you know, some implements and they, everything they needed to start a life out here and they homesteaded. His name is Wes Fields. And Wes Fields was a remarkable guy in my opinion. He was in his 90s and still doing yoga. And a uh, very friendly guy and I went and visited him and he told me stories about when he was a young boy and he saw the Indians coming out in their horse-drawn uh, wagons all the way from Fort Hall. And it was only when he was 80 years old or so, he went out and followed them down into the Camas Swamp and uh, to find out what they were doing. 
<clears throat> By then his farm was 10,000 acres big. And he eventually sold almost all of it to the Macaw family, cellular uh, fortunes in Sun Valley. But he was living out there in a, in a very nice, uh, very nice home with his wife, Mary Pat. And he said when he went down into the swamp, he said he met this guy. <clears throat> now this guy is Lionel Boyer, Lionel Q. Boyer, who um, I've gotten to know him uh, through my conversations. He guided me through this project. He made uh, recommendations, which I was happy to follow. I also consulted with many other people, friends. Um, and he, uh, he and Wes are actually got to be very good friends. Wes went to the powwow. Wes invited them to come back and why not start a Native American festival in Fairfield called Camas Lily Days. Now, Camas Lily Days had existed before, back in the 70s, but it had kind of fallen by the wayside. And these guys put their heads together, called all their friends, and they decided to bring a Native American uh, element to Fairfield, Camas Lily Days, to celebrate their returns to Camas Prairie. And so it takes place uh, in about the first week of June, depending on when the, the bulbs bloom. It could be late May, it could be early June. And uh, they do their gathering, but they also do a ceremonial run. They involve the, the kids from Fort Hall with the kids from Fairfield. And uh, one year there were all kinds of different people there and you get to learn to dance and you get to learn to appreciate native culture. It's an exhibition powwow. And this is one day, oh, three or four years ago, Camus Lily Day. These are young fancy dancers. It's kind of a, a newer kind of powwow dancing, I believe. And uh, where you can use um, very flashy um, materials. And when these guys dance and spin around, it's an amazing thing to see. Um, so that's kind of where I generally end things is with, um, you know, my effort was to bring uh, an addition to the history that we all know about the Wood River Valley. And um, we often hear about the mining, we often hear about the skiing. Uh, here's a story about the miners in the Stanley Basin in 1873. 23 men discovered gold. <clears throat> and then it says the remote country and the roving Indians forced the men to leave without working their discovery. However, they were back a year later. And of course there was a gold boom. And it's those roving Indians you got to look out for. Here's one right there. That's my wife. She's a Tuscarora Indian. And she was roving with me that day on our mountain bikes. So don't be afraid if you see a roving Indian. Go say hi. They're probably friendly. I hope some of you are giggling by now. I can't hear it, but I know you're out there. That's the end of my talk. And if you have any questions, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing here and let Kristen take over. Well, that was, uh, that was a wonderful presentation, Tony. Um, and so I don't know, I still have you on spotlight. Um, I'm going to take you off spotlight. I can. Yes, there we go. So you will be one little tile uh, amongst many. If you, there we go. Um, so if you want to see everybody that's here now, um, go up to your upper right hand corner and uh, click gallery view and that will allow you to see um, quite a number of black tiles with names on it <laughs> and a few faces. But um, we do have uh, a couple of questions, Tony. Uh, one is, are there conversations about land reparations happening, perhaps retiring farmers through conservation easements and land trust providing cultural land outside yeah. of the reservation? Yeah, good question, Amy. I, um, I'm forgetting now, are you with the Nature Conservancy or the Land Trust? I think Amy's with the Sun Valley Institute. Oh, that's it, <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, there are conversations 
And there are, I believe, I don't know if outright reparations is really the goal, um, but I do know that um, Nature Conservancy, um, for example, has established uh, an entire new department called Indigenous and Local Peoples Program. And I've been in touch with their director, Eric Noyes. He happens to have some deep connections in, in uh, Mohawk country. We, we know a lot of people in common. And um, they are looking to communicate with uh, Shoshone and Bannock people. And also uh, they're working with tribes in 33 different states. Um, and whenever you know people ask me if there's a way that they can reach out and find some communication, I try to just I try to connect people with the language and culture or preservation department. Louise Dixie and Bobette Haskett and um, Nolan Brown, the people I know there, and others. And um, most recently, I got a call from. Um, Matthew Ward, who's the uh, watershed director at the Flat Ranch in Island Park. And we were all on a Zoom call um, with the communications director from TNC. And um, he told me that he had uh, hundreds of acres of blue camas at um, the Flat Ranch, which is a TNC conservation easement ranch um, protected from development. And he said, Would you know of anybody who? you know, native people who would want to take advantage of this canvas. And so I just simply called down to Louise Dixie. I sent some emails and immediately they said, yeah, we want to find out about uh, Flat Ranch and see about gathering canvas there. So, um, you know, that's an example of the kind of thing that's happening. I think um, I do know of through, through my TNC contacts, there is at least one TNC property that was quite large. And, and for those of you who don't know, these are, uh, this is a private nonprofit with a billion dollars in assets. And they have um, secured land from development using conservation easements around the country and around the world. And there's one uh, in uh, Oregon, and I don't know the exact location. Um, it might be the Cow Creek Band, um, where they've actually given the conservation property over to the tribes, you know, in title. So I believe that's going to be happening more when people who are serious about conservation come to realize that the best conservators of the land are the people who know and appreciate it and are connected to the land and don't want to destroy the traditional crops, the traditional use. And, um, you know, native communities for a number of reasons are probably the best stewards of the land. Um, best protectors of the land. And so how those relationships develop, it's one of the things I want to follow in my work as a journalist. Um, uh, just a comment um, that the site of the Bear River Massacre, um, which is on the Bear River in um, southern Idaho, northern uh, Utah, okay. um, some of that land, that particular band didn't have any land. Um, and there was a, a gentleman that owned a farmer ranch there and he gave some or all of it to the tribe so they had some small piece of land that they could call their own. Okay. I can tell you, I'll tell you my, my own tribe is, and I think many are, are, uh, are going after um, land that they were either promised or it was taken from them or it was in a treaty and never uh, ratified or you know the rule was broken. <clears throat> Camas Prairie belongs by right to the Shoshone and Bannock people since the 1860s when uh, the treaty was written up. But they were swindled out of it. So, you know, the idea of reparations might be a very, um, maybe a very good idea. Um, Tony, I think this is uh, the last uh, question that we'll have. Um, uh, someone says, I note that you use the word Indian in the title of your book, um, but you use Native American and other terms as you speak. Can you explain that usage? Oh, I like what else she wrote, though. I learned a lot. Very <laughs> Quite a few people said that. <laughs> yeah, <there's laughs> that part out. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a general generic term for Native people. 
Um, I've heard it all my life. It's been used in my family, by my grandmother, by my mother. I don't have an issue with it. <clears throat> if I'm up in, you know, my, my uncle's married into the Micmacs, for instance, and um, Micmac, and uh, his, you know, his wife, Brenda, we went up there and played golf and went to his wedding and everything. And, you know, they all call each other Indians too. I don't think it's unusual. Now, you know, Native American is, was, you know, really is also, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think I used it, I used both Indians and Native American in an article just yesterday. They're interchangeable in my opinion. And um, I worried about it because when I went off to college, people said, you're not supposed to say Indian anymore. And I said, well, you know, it's kind of weird. I mean, I, I know I'm Mohawk and I'm not even Mohawk, I'm Ganyangahada. Now, who's gonna know Ganyangahada? So, you know, it, it goes from being very specific and I'm also Ganawage Ganyangahada and the Bear Clan, you know, Okwari Ganyankahaga from Ganawaga. Nobody's going to know what that means. But they're going to know what Mohawk means, which is a Danish word borrowed from the French or something. I call myself Mohawk too, but I also, you know, I think, um, I think Indian is a very helpful term. I think Sherman Alexi got called out on that when he gave a talk in Boise a couple of years ago. I thought it was hilarious because <clears throat> they said someone else asked him, you know, why do you keep using the word Indian? It's not proper. You should say Native American. And I think Sherman's answer was, look, that's our word. You've taken everything else. You can't have that word, okay? We're going we're gonna to stick with that word. But that opens a can of worms with regard to, you know, identity. And um, I think whatever, you know, if there's a Native person, you're talking to somebody, even if they're not enrolled, I happen to be an enrolled member, which gives you a certain feeling of, I don't know, entitlement. I've never um, required that of anyone else, but it's have it, it, you know, let them tell you what they are and uh, that'll probably work. Well, I will say that um, we have comments. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you so much. Learned lots. Um, somebody had to leave. Uh, very absorbing. Many, thank, many thanks. Um, Incredible, thank you for sharing those examples. Learned a lot. I'm gonna be starting your book soon. Um, someone make the comment, so many parallels between, whoops, it just bumped up, between Native Americans, Indians, and Native Hawaiians, where this individual is uh, originally from. Um, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, <clears throat> the Native Hawaiians, their language has come back in, in mm -hmm. great force. And there is a Mohawk woman named Dorothy Lazor who was involved in advising them many years ago. And um, native cultures are getting, uh, are being revitalized everywhere in my lifetime. And many, many dozens and dozens have been enrolled and regained their federal recognition. So, um, boy, I love Hawaii. I was over there in, uh, you know, Kanaka, Maui, you know. And what a great, what a great place. I want to go live there one day. Tony, um, just to wrap up, could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing now? You mentioned uh, a couple of things, but maybe you could go a little yeah. bit more into, into detail. I think people would be really interesting, interested. Well, it, I just so happen to have the cover of my next book. It's right here. <clears throat> this is, uh, it hasn't been printed yet, but it's coming out at uh, Washington State University Press. And this is Teaching Native Pride. Upward Bound and a Legacy of Isabel Bond. I spent four years working on it. And um, it's gonna be published in November, Academic Press. Well, I still have to do my index. It's gonna take weeks. <clears throat> but it was a, a real pleasure and a joy. And um, the next book after that, I'm finishing one right now with Glenn Jans. You may have heard of her. She, was, she and Bill Jans owned the resort in Sun Valley for a number of years. And, uh, been collaborating with her on her autobiography. And uh, there'll be an article on that book in the Sun Valley Magazine coming out this fall or winter. And then I have a series of other projects and I'm working with National Public Radio a little bit and I'm uh, constantly writing stories for the Idaho Mountain Express, the world's, well, America's best newspaper. And you just wrote an article about um, the uh, Shoshone people and their use of salmon, right? Yes. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I'm trying to 
kind of you know pushing to my work here in the valley more more reporting from a native perspective and reaching out to those communities for sources so. well any uh, last minute um, questions or anything from anybody yeah that was a terrific talk tony um, oh, yeah. thank you very it's very much uh, feel free to contact me i'm pretty easy to reach in town if you want to continue the conversation my uh, Phone numbers and emails are all over the place. And, okay. <laughs> and um, uh, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I'll be sending out a, an email with a slightly edited version of this video, kind of tidying up both the front end and the back end of it. Uh, and I'll include um, some of the links that we talked about, um, the 16,000 year old uh, dis, uh, discovery, I call it dis discovery, archaeological discovery, um, was in Science Magazine. Um, let's see what else to write down. Uh, I'll include the date of the Shoban powwow uh, and a, a link to the Nature Conservancy's uh, Indigenous Peoples Program, just so some of the things that Tony talked about, it'll be a resource for you, hopefully. So. Um, so uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming. And um, thank you again, Tony, very much. Thank you, Kristen. I, I think um, I love what you're doing at the library. Thanks for bringing us all together today. It was a real pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a nice night. Bye-bye.